Thanks very much. Um, it's a great honour to be here and to introduce um, Professor Leonidas Kyriakides. And like you, um, I'm really looking forward to hearing his keynote this morning. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Leonidas and I've followed his work for nearly two decades. Uh, I first met Leonidas through the um, ICSI, the International Congress for School Effectiveness and School Improvement. Um, and we had a joint interest in methodological issues and theory in school and teacher effectiveness studies. Uh, and later on, we worked together as a convener and co-convener, uh, and then Leonidas took over as convener for our SIG-18 group in early on education effectiveness. Um, uh, and we've also published together with uh, Bert Kremer's um, work on um, advances uh, in education effectiveness research. But let's look a little bit back at uh, uh, Leonidas's past. Where did he come from? Well, Leonidas studied maths at the Empire State College of the State of New York, and he took a master's and a doctorate in England at the University of Warwick um, under Professor Ron Campbell. Um, I think it's very true to say that Leonidas has been highly influential in his contributions to um, the um, international development and advancement of first school effectiveness and teacher effectiveness, but also as the field developed into the broader concept of educational effectiveness research. And his most recent work has certainly taken us into the area of school and teacher development and improvement. So his interests uh, include teacher quality and effectiveness and professional development. And that's going to be the focus of this keynote this morning, uh, which I'm delighted about. But Leonidas has a very strong interest in equity, and that's another theme of this conference, um, promoting inclusion and cohesion. And though he's well known for his work studying academic outcomes of students from different age groups, preschool through to older age secondary students, um, he's also interested in other uh, newer outcomes and also social uh, and effective outcomes. And a very interesting European collaboration study um, was developing a bullying prevention intervention that was tested then in a range of European countries. Um, Leonidas is particularly well known um, uh, for his uh, work and a long association with our dear and esteemed colleague, um, Professor Bert Kremers uh, from the Netherlands, uh, and that has led to a very productive association, uh, particularly to the development of the dynamic model in education effectiveness research, and they have a book on that, and the new model, the dynamic model of school improvement. And that was a real advancement in theory because um, uh, Leonidas and Bert particularly uh, meant that we stopped looking at schools as static uh, institutions or the notion of teachers as static, but thought about change and hence the word dynamic. So I always think of them as the dynamic duo, but we're going to hear from one of the dynamic duo, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Kyriakides now. Thank you. Good morning. I would like, first of all, to thank uh, the organizers of the early conference for giving me the opportunity to share with you the work that we have done in our attempt to establish a dynamic approach to teacher professional development and that basically aims to promote student learning outcomes through improving quality of teaching. Let me also thank Professor Samuels for chairing this session and for her very kind introduction. As you have heard, my field of research and scholarship is in the area of educational effectiveness. Let me remind you that educational effectiveness research addresses the question on what works in education and why. The origins of ER stem basically from reactions to the work on equal opportunity undertaken back in 1960s from Jenk and Coleman. These two studies coming basically from two different disciplinary backgrounds, psychology and sociology. Um, basically reveal that very small variation in student learning outcomes can be explained by educational factors. Therefore, the very first two effectiveness studies undertaken by Edmonds in United States and Rutter in United Kingdom we are concerned with examining evidence and making an argument about the potential power of schooling 
uh, to make a difference in students' life chances. Since then, many effectiveness studies have been conducted around the world. And these effectiveness studies basically didn't only show that teachers and school matter. They also reveal that the classroom level can explain more of the variance in QBL outcomes than the school level. Moreover, meta-analysis of teacher effectiveness studies reveal that a large proportion of this classroom level variance can be explained by what teachers do in the classroom, by their behavior. It is for this reason that I decided to give a presentation on teacher effectiveness research rather than on school effectiveness research and draw application for teacher professional development purposes. More specifically, during the first part of my presentation, I will provide a brief overview of early uh, teacher effectiveness studies. Uh, then I will discuss the two major methodological and conceptual limitations of these fields. In the third part of the presentation, I will refer to the work that we have done together with Bert Klimers and my colleagues at the University of Cyprus in our attempt to develop a model that basically attempts to address these uh, limitations, the dynamic model that Pam also mentioned earlier, aims to establish stronger links between research and practice. During this part, I will refer exclusively to studies that attempted to test one of the assumptions of this model. The model assumes that factors which operate at the same level are related to each other. And studies testing this assumption basically identify stages of effective teaching. Obviously, these findings had some implications to our attempt to develop a specific approach to teacher professional development. So in the fourth part of my presentation, I will refer to the dynamic approach to teacher professional development, and finally, to experimental studies which have been, invest which, which have been conducted in order to identify the impact of this approach on promoting student learning outcomes. Let me begin, first of all, with the brief overview of early teacher effectiveness studies. As you may all be aware, during the last four decades, researchers attempted to identify whether specific factors measuring quality of teaching, basically teacher behavior, can predict student achievement gains. Various factors have been examined. Um, we believe that the factors which have been examined can be classified into three broader categories. The first one has to do with the quantity of instruction. And here, the assumption is that amount learned can be related to opportunity to learn. Actually, we have many studies, even back in the 1970s, showing that achievement can be maximized when teachers prioritize academic instruction. For example, effective teachers are seen as those who are able to organize and manage the classroom environment in an efficient way, and in this way, student engagement rates can be maximized. The second overarching factor is not concerned with quantity of teaching, but rather with the quality of teaching. With the, the researchers basically look at teachers' ability to provide um, information to raise questions and give feedback. In regard to this overarching factor, one can identify an interest and in various studies under the structuring factor. Various studies basically show that effective teachers are able to outline the content to be covered, to call attention to main ideas, to review main ideas at the end. At this point, let me remind you that summary reviews can be seen as important since they help teachers as students integrate and reinforce the learning of major points. The other factor that uh, was examined had to do with the communication skills of teachers. 
Special emphasis was given to the questioning skills of teachers in regard to their ability to provide questions. For example, we have studies which show that in effective classrooms, imbalance between product and process questions can be observed. And finally, application tasks were found to be critical for student learning. The third overarching factor has to do with the classroom climate. One can observe that researchers look at various aspects of classroom climate. However, in this transparency, you can see the five aspects of classroom climate which we are more systematically examined. The first two basically refers to the type of interactions that exist in the classroom. And again, let me remind you that, in, that learning actually takes place through interaction. The other three elements refer to the attempt of teachers to create a business-like and supportive classroom environment. However, there are some limitations. It should first of all be acknowledged that as most effectiveness studies, especially back in 1980s, 1990s, were exclusively focused on language or mathematics. One could therefore argue that ER should take into account the new goals of education and related to these, their implications for teaching and learning. This basically implies that new theories of teaching and learning, which characterize learning as a self-regulated and constructive process, should be used in defining factors of effective teaching. Actually, during the last decade, an interest on identifying the impact of factors associated with the new learning approaches can be really clearly observed in the literature. Moreover, two recent meta-analyses reveal that factors coming both from the direct and active teaching approach, as well as from the new learning approach, are associated with student learning outcomes, specific factors, not all the factors which were examined. In our view, this implies that an integrated approach to teaching should be adapted. Uh, I do agree with those who claim that imposing unnecessary dichotomies between different teaching approaches might be counterproductive. <laughs> Let me move to the second major limitation. The second limitation has to do with the fact that teacher effectiveness research has not contributed significantly to teachers' professional development. In a book that we published with Bert Krimers and my colleague uh, Antonio in 2013, um, we uh, show that research on teacher training and research on teacher effectiveness have been compacted apart from and without much reference to one another. Actually, one can identify very few studies which attempt to evaluate the impact of teacher professional development on student learning. On the other hand, very few investigators within the field of teacher effectiveness spend time speculating about the methods that can be used to improve teaching practice. In this context, we developed, as I mentioned at the beginning, the dynamic model of education effectiveness. Uh, the model is shown in this transparency, and as you can see, it's a multi-level model it refers to factors which operate at four levels, the student, the bottom, the classroom, the school, and the system level. The teaching and learning situation is emphasized, and the role of the two main actors, students and teachers, are analyzed. The model also assumes that school-level factors are important, and school-level factors are basically able to influence teaching and and, and student uh, and, and teaching and learning situation through developing and evaluating the school policy for teaching and the school policy for creating a school learning environment. Finally, the model assumes that factors at the system level 
are also related with student learning outcomes, and the model refers to the influence of the educational system, especially through developing and evaluating the educational policy either at the regional or at the national level. At the top, you can see that a specific framework is used to define each fa factors operating at the teacher, school, and system level. More specifically, five dimensions are used. These are the frequency, focus, stage, quality, and differentiation. I'll take a few minutes presenting each of these dimensions. First of all, the frequency is a quantitative way to measure the functioning of each factor. And is actually the dimension that most studies take into account. The other four dimensions examine qualitative characteristics of uh, the factors. In regard to the focus dimension, two aspects are taken into account. The first one refers to the specificity of the activities associated with the functioning of the factor. And activities could be either too specific or too general. For example, structuring tasks may refer just to a part of a lesson or to a series of lessons. The second aspect that is taken into account addresses the purposes for which an activity takes place. An activity may be expected to achieve a single purpose or multiple purposes. If all the activities associated with the factor are expected to achieve a single purpose, then the chances to achieve this purpose are obviously quite high. But the effect of the factor might be small due to the fact that other purposes are not achieved and synergy may not exist. So the assumption here is that there should be a balance with respect to the two aspects of the focus dimension. For instance, observing teachers, we expect to see not only specific, too specific, but also general structuring tasks in their classrooms. The stage dimension refers to the period at which tasks associated with the factor take place. And the assumption is that factors need to take place over a long period of time to ensure that they have a continuous direct and indirect effect. For example, structuring tasks may take, may take place not just at the end of the lesson, but both at the beginning and throughout the lesson. The quality obviously refers to the properties of the factor. And finally, differentiation to the extent to which activities associated with the factor are implemented in the same way for all the subjects involved with it. And here the assumption is that we need adaptation, adaptation to the needs of each group of subjects. One could argue that these dimensions are not only important for measurement reasons, but also for theoretical reasons. Moreover, the use of these dimensions may help us to develop more comprehensive strategies for supporting teachers to improve since both, since the feedback which can be given to the teachers could refer both to quantitative and qualitative characteristics of the factors. In this a table, you can see the eight factors that are included in the model. I'm not going to refer to the, each of these factors. I would like simply to point out that in this table, one can see factors such as structuring, number two, questioning, number three, application, number five, and management of time, number seven. All of them actually have been mentioned and examined during the early teacher effectiveness studies. At the same time, one can see factors such as orientation, number one, and modeling, number four, which are in line with the new learning approaches to teaching. One could therefore argue that an integrated approach to effective teaching is at least adapted in developing the dynamic model. 
In the next table, you can see the studies which have been conducted since 2003 in order to test the validity of the model. We had eight longitudinal studies which investigated different aspects of the, mo uh, of the model as well as two meta-analyses. One quantitative synthesis of teacher effectiveness studies, more than 100 uh, studies, and one quantitative synthesis of school effectiveness studies that basically look at the impact of school factors. This, uh, in this, uh, at this step I would like only to point out that in regard to the teacher factors, we had uh, seven longitudinal studies. One of them was uh, a study that took place in six European countries, and they, these studies show that uh, student achievement, the teacher factors can explain variation in student achievement in cognitive, uh, affective, and one study in metacognitive learning outcomes. Let me only mention to you that a recent study has been conducted in Ghana and revealed that teacher factors are related with student achievement gains in mathematics. And let me uh, remind you that in Ghana, the average classroom effect size is 45. References to these studies are provided in the next transparency for those who may like to find more information about the studies. One of the most essential difference of this model from previous model is, as I mentioned earlier, is the fact that we expect factors operating at the same level to be related to each other. And in, re in regard to teaching factors, we expect to be able to find relations and define grouping of factors. Obviously, this assumption has implications for teacher improvement. If this is the case, then one could argue that improvement of teacher effectiveness can be focused not on the acquisition of isolated skills, concerned with a specific factor each time, but on helping teachers develop types of teacher behavior that are more effective than others. Actually, this assumption was tested by studies conducted in four different countries, which provided support to the assumption and also helped us to identify stages of effective teaching. That was a quite surprising result for us when we first found about it. In uh, the next transparencies, I will um, pre briefly present the first study which was conducted in Cyprus through which we are able to identify five stages of effective teaching. First of all, in regard to the participants, we are all the grade five students from each class of 50 primary schools in here in Cyprus. And we had measures of student achievement in three different learning outcomes, mathematics, Greek language, and religious education. Written tests were administered at the beginning and at the end of the school year. In regard to the religious education, we had measures of cognitive and affective learning outcomes. And the, in, in order to measure the skills of teachers, the eight factors and their dimensions, we use two low inference and one high inference observation instruments. These instruments can actually be found in a book that we published with Bert in 2012 with Rutledge. And you can see there that they can help us to collect data concerned with all the factors and their dimensions. We ran a, an analysis. Uh, we used first the RASH model and then the SALTOS model. And we found out that the, these teaching skills can be situated in a developmental order and link with student outcomes. In this figure, you can see the uh, how the teaching skills have been classified. In regard to the first stage, one can see skills measuring the management of time factor, as well as quantitative characteristics 
or factors such as structuring, application, and questioning. Basically, factors concerned with the direct teaching approach are situated in this stage. In stage two, one can identify qualitative characteristics of this factor. For instance, you can find the stage dimension of structuring in this level, number one, or the quality dimension of application, or the stage dimension of questioning. Then we move to the level three. In this level, one can identify all the dimensions except differentiation of the classroom as a learning environment factor. So someone could claim that teachers who are situated at this stage are able to engage students actively in the teaching and learning situation. At the same time, one can identify skills measuring the frequency dimension of factors associated with the new learning approach. For instance, number four, frequency of teaching modeling and frequency of orientation. Then we move to, we jump quite a lot actually, to level four. In level four, one can identify skills that basically measure the differentiation dimension of these factors. And finally, in level five, you have skills that measure qualitative characteristics of factors associated with the new learning approach. We then run a multi-level analysis of student achievement data at the end of the school year for each of our four dependent variables in order to see whether teachers who are situated at the higher stages were more effective than those who are situated at the lower level. In table three, you can see the results that emerge from the uh, two analyses, language and mathematics. After controlling for student uh, background factors, we enter in model two four dummy variables. Teachers who are situated at stage three were treated as the reference group. And as you can see from the parameter estimates, teachers who were situated at stage one and low two in the lower stages, stage one and, and stage two, had lower student learning outcomes than those who are situated at stage three, whereas those who are situated at stage four and five had better student learning outcomes. Basically, the same result in regard to religious education. The only difference here is that we didn't find any teacher of religious education who was situated at stage five, so we enter only three dummy variables rather than four. A question that can be easily raised is whether teachers can move from one stage of teaching competence to the next. And actually, that was the main reason that we attempted to develop the dynamic approach to teacher professional development. The dynamic approach basically lies between the two dominant approaches to teacher professional development, the competency-based and the holistic approach. Let me, at this point, remind you that the competency-based approach is based on the assumption that program requirements should be stated as competences, which should describe specifically the skills that the teacher must demonstrate. And obviously, these skills are associated each time with a single factor. On the other hand, the holistic approach is based on the assumption that teachers are reflective practitioners and are therefore able to handle their improvement based on their own experiences and critical thinking. So the approach promotes reflection. In regard to the dynamic approach, we believe that the content of teacher professional development could derive from the grouping of teaching skills included in the model. And in this way, the professional development programs should be differentiated to meet the needs and priorities of teachers at each developmental stage. At the same time, we acknowledge the importance of reflection. So we expect teachers to reflect on their own practice, 
But this time, reflection is more focused. It's about the skills that were found to belong to the stage that the teacher was found to be situated. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we had to investigate the impact of this approach on promoting student learning outcomes. For this reason, four different experimental studies were conducted. I'm going to refer just one of these studies, the one that was conducted here in Cyprus. We had a sample of 130 primary teachers, volunteers, and we collected data from all students of the teacher sample using a battery of written tests at the beginning and at the end of the intervention. The first one was basically the initial evaluation phase. By conducting external observations, we measure the skills of the teachers, and by following exactly the same approach as in the previous study, we were able to classify them into the five levels which were mentioned earlier. Then the teachers who are found to be situated at a specific stage were randomly split into two groups. For example, we found that around 32 teachers were situated in stage one, 16 of them were, 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 asked, were, were given the opportunity to employ the dynamic approach, and whereas the other group made use of the holistic approach. Obviously, phase three is the, is the most critical one. It has to do with the intervention. Let me explain to you the kind, first of all, of sessions that were offered to teachers employing the dynamic approach. As you can see, teachers were assigned to groups according to the stage in which they were found to be situated. And then, a literature review concerning only with the teaching skills which correspond to their stage was provided by the advisory team. The advisory team also helped teachers to recognize the area on which each group had to concentrate their efforts for improvement. And each teacher was expected to develop its, his or her own action plan. And she could do that by exchanging ideas with the research team as well as with colleagues, members of his group. After the development of the first draft of the action plan, monthly sessions were organized. In these, these monthly sessions, again, were organized in groups, and here the teachers had the chance to share experiences in implementing their action plans and get feedback from colleagues and the advisory team in order to modify their action plans and improve them further. This was done till the end of the school year. Let's move, let's move now to the teachers who made use of the holistic approach. The primary aim of these sessions was to help teachers to critically evaluate their own beliefs and practice and help them transform their experiences from a past event to an ongoing learning process. So, for this reason, they also had the chance to discuss in groups. This time, they could identify any problem that they consider important and formulate a plan, an action plan, to tackle this problem. Again, monthly sessions were offered, and this basically gave them the chance to exchange ideas and uh, reflect on the activities which they attempted to implement during the period uh, that the intervention took place, and in this way, basically, to uh, modify and improve their action plans. What about the results? The dynamic approach was, first of all, found to be more effective than the holistic approach in improving teaching skills. As you can see from the first bullets, a statistically significant progress in the teaching skills of teachers employing the dynamic approach was identified. On the other hand, no change in the teaching skills 
of teachers employing the holistic approach was observed. Let me at this point mention that none of the teachers employing the holistic approach managed also to move from one stage to another. Employing the dynamic approach had also an impact on student learning outcomes. Here you can see the analysis of the results of student achievement in mathematics at the end of the year, at the end of the intervention basically, and in model 5, I skip all the other details, by entering a dummy variable, it was found out that teachers who made use of the dynamic approach had better student learning outcomes than teachers who made use of the holistic approach. The description of this experimental study helped us basically to understand the basic characteristics of the dynamic approach as well as the steps that can be followed in implementing it. First of all, one could argue that the dynamic approach is in line with teachers' professional needs, at least as they are measured through the classroom observations. It's also more focused because it attempts to address group skills that are basically related with the stage at which each teacher was found to be situated. The dynamic approach also attempts to support teachers' move from one stage to the next by combining systematic and guided critical reflection with competency development. In the next part of the transparency, you can see the basic steps of this approach. What we are suggesting here is that at the very first step, we need evaluation data, classroom observations, in the case of the dynamic approach, in order to identify the professional needs and priorities of teachers. Then, the advisory and research team has a critical role to play. Guidelines for improvement can be given to the teachers in order to help them develop their action plans. At this point, it's probably important to mention that the dynamic approach is not only based on the assumption that teachers should develop action plans. Formative evaluation mechanisms should also be established. This can help them to uh, modify their action plans and in this way to have an impact on their teaching skills. Obviously, at the end of the intervention, a final measure is expected to take place. This is done for summative reasons, but not simply for helping teachers, helping researchers measure the impact of the dynamic approach. The uh, results that emerge from the final measure can actually help us to provide feedback to the teachers, especially on whether during the next year they can move with a new improvement area or whether there is a need to concentrate on, uh, the, uh, on the area that they spent time during the previous year. In the last part of my presentation, I will refer to two recent projects that basically attempt to expand the scope of the dynamic approach. These projects, the first one, is concerned with the assessment skills of teachers, and the second with the long-term effect of the dynamic approach. In regard to the assessment skills, the project takes into account the fact that classroom assessment in the literature was found to be an important effectiveness factor. The formative purpose of assessment was found to be associated with student achievement gains, but teachers' everyday practice still appears to be outcome-oriented. One can identify studies and an interest on providing um, teacher educational uh, and professional development courses 
uh, to students with particular to student teachers and teachers with particular reference to assessment, but still the practice remains to be outcome oriented. So these projects assumes that this um, result has to do with the fact that teacher skills in assessment and how these can be developed uh, were, were not taken into account um, as seriously as one might expect in the literature. So the first attempt was to measure the assessment skills of teachers. And we used a specific framework to measure assessment skills. This framework basically looks at three different aspects of, of assessment skills. The first one has to do with the assessment cycle. The second, with the ability of the teachers to use different assessment techniques. And the third aspect, with the five dimensions included in the dynamic model. Let me on, only mention here that the reason that we looked for the phases of assessment is because we assume that effective teachers are those who are able to construct appropriate tools, phase one, and follow appropriate procedures in administering these rules. So in this way, they can collect reliable and valid assessment data. Then they are able to record assessment data in an efficient way without losing information. And finally, reporting the results to students and parents in order to help them take decisions for formative reasons. In the transparency, you can also see that in measuring teachers' assessment skills, specifically in mathematics, we took into account the four most common types of assessment that take place in mathematics. So the first attempt was to develop a questionnaire. It was not possible to measure specific skills through classroom observation. For instance, reporting of data may not take place during a teaching especially with parents. And so the only way that we could measure the assessment skills of teachers was through a, a questionnaire, a teacher questionnaire. The questionnaire was consisted of 87 items which cover the three aspects of the framework. This questionnaire was administered to a randomly selected sample of 10% of Cypriot primary teachers and a relatively high response rate was obtained, more than 50% actually. And by following the same approach as previously, we first of all analyzed the data that emerged from these liquor scales with the extended logistic model of Raj. And as you can see, a good fit to the model was uh, identified. Then we made use of the method that Marco Lidis and Dresner developed in order to classify these uh, skills. And we found out that a four cluster solution explains more than 60%, whereas a fifth, the fifth cap only adds 3%. So for, for parsimonious reasons, we decided to stick to a four cluster solution. To test the internal validity of the study, we conducted semi-structural interviews with eight teachers who responded also to the questionnaire. And by comparing the data that emerged from the teacher questionnaires and the interviews, we were able to provide support to the internal validity of the study. The four stages which were identified are shown basically in this transparency. I'm not going to refer to each type specifically, 
But let me simply point out that one can see a movement from more simple skills to more complicated skills. For example, teachers who were found to be situ situated at stage one reported that they are using only written tests and attempt to measure basic skills and this was done for summative rather than formative reasons. You can see that stages were situated at, at, type, at sta type three, make uh, use a broader perspective of assessment techniques and attempt to measure more complex objectives. In the phase, the second phase, we attempted to see whether the dynamic approach could also be used for supporting teachers improve their assessment skills. So we invited the teachers who participated in the first phase of the study to attend a teacher professional development course on assessment. We received positive feedback from more than 40%, and these 76 teachers were basically split into two groups. The one made use of the dynamic approach, and the other one, the competency-based approach. Teachers who decided not to attend any insert course were treated as a kind of control group, despite the methodological limitations, obviously. You can see here some descriptive data. As you can see, at the beginning of the intervention, no uh, difference could, uh, was identified. And also, teachers who are situated and who, who did not attend any course basically did not manage to improve their assessment skills. Both groups, those who employ the dynamic approach and the competency-based approach, managed to improve their assessment skills. But, the, um, but it was found out that those who made use of the dynamic approach had managed to have a, a, a bigger progress, especially since at the end of the intervention, statistically significant differences between these two groups were identified, was identified. And finally, the impact of this approach on student learning outcomes, on their achievement in mathematics. In, the, in model three, uh, two dummy variables were basically added one for each experimental group, and the control group was treated as a reference group. And as you can see here, those who made use of the dynamic pro approach managed to have slightly better student learning outcomes than those of the control group. The last project is basically an attempt to see whether a three-year insert course on improving teaching based on the dynamic approach uh, can be um, uh, offered to the teacher. And this is due to the fact that all programs which were uh, offered in the past were just provided to teachers for only one school year. Moreover, a study measuring the sustainability of the, teacher, of the dynamic approach revealed that during the year that no intervention was offered, so one year after the intervention, the teaching skills of teachers who are offered the dynamic approach didn't improve. Hopefully, they didn't decline either. Taking in mind the argument that it's sometimes easier for a teacher to improve than to maintain a standard of excellence, teachers we are offered a three-year professional development program to see whether we can find changes or stability in their teaching skills, especially after the second or third year. At this point, let me remind you that in the literature of teaching professional development, the duration of the courses is considered important. So to some extent, this study addresses this question too. The method that was followed was basically similar with the experimental studies that mentioned earlier. Initial evaluation, splitting, 
participants into two, into two groups, those who made use of the dynamic approach and those who made use of the control group. And here, very briefly, the results. First of all, at the beginning of the intervention, no statistically significant difference was observed. Statistically significant progress can be observed if one looks from what happened at the beginning of the intervention till the end of the third year for the dynamic approach group and stability in the case of the control group that made use of the holistic approach. <coughs> then we attempted to calculate effect sizes by comparing the data that emerged from the baseline assessment and the baseline measure, sorry, and the measure at the end of the first year, we found out that a very small effect size could be observed. If you take into account the progress that was made during two years, the effect size goes up to 30, and even slightly higher when you look at what happened during the third three years, it goes to 39. This seems to show that duration of the program plays an important role in improving teaching skills. What is, however, important is to mention that in this study, we have a significant larger number of teachers who managed to move from one stage to the other during these three years. 21 teachers, but only nine managed to move during the first year. We also found out that eight out of these nine teachers managed to move from one stage to the other during the first year, and all of these eight were situated at either the first or the second stage. Actually, those who were situated at stage four, they only managed to move during the third year of the implementation of the program. So one could argue that it takes more time for dynamic approach to help teachers move from the first three stages to the last two stages. And this finding is, in a sense, in line with the results of the Saltus model and the big divide that set the big dip that separates the stages, the stage three from stage four and the stage four to stage five. So one could argue that the duration plays an important role, but at the same time, we should bear in mind that there are different optimal points of duration for teacher professional development program based on the dynamic approach for teachers situated at different stages. I will finish my presentation by providing a structuring task. We are talking uh, so a lot about structuring, so it might be a good idea. What are the main messages of this presentation. The first, during the first actually part of the presentation, I tried to argue that an integrated approach to effective teaching should be adapted. Researchers in the area of teacher effectiveness should not look on whether a factor is associated with one approach or the other, but should simply concentrate on the impact of each factor on student learning outcomes. Actually, this was taken into account in developing the dynamic model. And as you have seen, the model that was presented in the third part attempted to introduce a specific framework. What does this framework tell us? Is that basically we need both quantitative and qualitative characteristics uh, of the functioning of teacher factors to be measured, not just the frequency dimension. An important assumption that comes from the dynamic model was that factors are interrelated and studies basically reveal stages of effective teaching. Not in every country the same stages have been actually observed, but at least the teaching skills could be grouped into different stages. Based on this finding, the dynamic approach was developed and its added value could basically be attributed to
to the fact that it encourages reflection, but more focused reflection. In our view, reflection can be more effective when the improvement priorities of teachers are taken into account, and teachers are encouraged to develop action plans and address their needs rather than let them develop any kind of action plan they like, as it is implied by the holistic approach. In regard to the two recent studies, the recent projects, the attempt to see whether the scope of the dynamic approach can be broadened, it was first of all shown that some stages of teacher skills in assessment can be identified and that the dynamic approach could, can have an impact on improving assessment practice. A small but still a significant one. In regard to the latter projects, the one that where the dynamic approach was offered for a longer period of time, I think what is clear is that uh, the intervention at least does not reach up to a limit. It can have further effects at least for by offering it for a longer period, at least for a specific group of teachers, for teachers situated at stage four and five. Different optimal points were obviously identified, points of duration, and this basically implies that policy uh, makers should, um, that should attempt to establish different training courses in order to address the needs of specific groups of teachers according to their stage, and by, at the same time take into account that uh, the duration of these programs might not necessarily be the same. The final, very final part, uh, suggest some suggestions for further research. First of all, we need further research to see whether the dynamic model can be developed further. As you can see, the model refers only to generic teaching skills. A recent project, project attempts to see whether the model could be expanded in order to cover domain-specific teaching skills. At least the relation between the two is quite interesting uh, question. At the moment, I'm afraid we don't have any data to share with you. There is also a need to measure not just the short, but also the long effect of the dynamic model of the dynamic approach, and finally, we should search for ways of addressing not simply the teachers, but also the school factors, as it was explained in the very first part of my presentation, the model does not refer only to teacher, but also to the school level factors, so one could assume that by addressing not simply the teacher, but also the school factors through the dynamic approach, we may have a stronger impact on promoting student learning outcomes. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that. Thank you very much, Leonidas, um, for your excellent presentation and timekeeping. Um, I'm going to chair the questions, so I'm sure there are questions here. Um, there are mics roving around, both on the top gallery and the bottom, so if people would like to ask some questions for Leonidas, um, we'll try and uh, have it, get a bit of a discussion going. Um, anybody questions? Yes, we have one here. So, thank you very much. Uh, my question is, from a research point of view, to group teachers and stages might be helpful, but from a developmental point of view, I have about 
hundred students and I can't group them into stages, it would be better for them to learn together than to have a differentiated profile. So would you would you say yes that would be definitely I agree with that, but um, thanks for the question. We are not in favor of, of, of ability grouping at the classroom level, but for providing teacher professional development courses, in our view, this might be more um, helpful. Obviously, we did not test whether we could um, have the dynamic approach based on uh, a different settings. The teachers to be together um, uh, for coming from different um, 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 stages uh, for practical reasons. It was more, of, it more, more easy to organize these groups different day, on different days and uh, deal with that more uh, effectively in terms of efficiently, let's say. But definitely that's a very interesting question. We also had a, an, uh, and I, I, I hope that we would, could address this to see whether by by grouping teachers in the, in the sessions together coming uh, from different stages, they can learn, for instance, teachers who are at stage one from teachers who are at stage three and four. So the point here is not so much in terms of grouping them during the in-service training course, and thanks so much for picking it up, but basically encouraging each teacher to develop an action plan that is in line with his or her own professional needs. Maybe this is too obvious, but sometimes we don't do that. By letting them cover any aspect that they like, then you may end up with teachers who are at stage one to develop an action plan in order to differentiate their instruction because they believe strongly in differentiation and at the end of the day, they cannot do anything because they need first of all to learn how, learn how to deal with basic routines and then move to more complicated tasks. Thank you. Have we more questions for Leonidas? Yes. It's hard with the lights, so I'm trying <laughs> to make sure I see everybody. Thank you very much. Wait, Thank you. Um, I was wondering whether we can so far start working with doing this professional development with this teacher training. Because I it's professional development only. Not with initial teacher training. They were talking about teachers who are, actually, who are also volunteers, and that's another uh, limitation. They were not, they, these were not uh, compulsory in service training courses, so they were teachers who were volunteers. And uh, for this reason, we had data from their student learning outcomes. We haven't run any study with uh, the initial teacher training. Yeah, that's that's a very good uh, question, a very good challenge for us to see how we can organize it at uh, the university level. I'm uh, um, a member of the Department of Education at the university here, but I uh, and in, I don't know how uh, um, whether uh, at some point we can persuade my colleagues to organize the teaching practice based on this approach. But at least the teaching practice uh, that is offered to the uh, teachers here in Cyprus uh, takes into account the factors that are included in the model. Thank you. Yeah. We have a question in the top balcony. If there isn't a mic up on the top. Yeah, um, thank, you. thank you for the talk. I have two comments or questions. Um, the first one is, I, I, would, I, I sort of have a problem with the concept of states. If you go into a classroom and observe a teacher for an extended period of time, somebody there for one hour, you can see that teacher doing something very simplistic now, and 10 minutes after is doing something really, really sophisticated. Sorry. Sorry. Or you observe one teacher teaching mathematics, and then in the next hour, the teacher is teaching another talk, another subject matter, and doing completely something. It's a totally different, different approach. So I would like to know, on the one hand, like, how do you manage with this issue? Because it's an important thing. Yeah. And the second, um, with regards to the dynamic approach, I sort of have the feeling that it's somehow a 
very bad directive approach. It's really traditional in a way that you have a researcher or a team of researchers from the university coming to your classroom telling you you understand it's true and you need this. And you stress several times that this is based on teacher's need. I quite disagree that, that those are the needs of the teacher. Those are, are the needs that the researcher thinks that teachers have. Okay. So I really don't know if the teachers receive very well the feedback. I would like to hear a little bit more about this. Yeah. A very small comment in regard to the last comment first. Just to share with you an experience that we have. At some point we wanted to see whether teachers would like to deal with who are attending the dynamic approach, would like to look at an, a different stage or a different uh, intervention. And we encourage them to, to choose which intervention they like to have. Not just type A, not just type B, where we are situated. Unfortunately, we found just one out of probably 100 teachers who like to move. Bear in mind, obviously, that teachers here, that they attend this course, are volunteers. So basically, they like to change their teaching practice. So they got a description of what factors we are looking, and they, if they are not interested to change their teaching practice, they are free not to attend the course. So uh, when you get the results, the, observe, the, the feedback that you have is shared with the teachers. So we have sessions, one-to-one, -one, where we show what we have observed, the instruments with the ticks and the ones and the two, whether there was a, 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 a structuring task, whether there was not any orientation task, and we ask them to tell us, do you think that is worthy to implement a project on and to develop an action plan addressing these and these factors. So it's not a top-down approach that is followed. I'm sorry that I didn't have time to uh, give more information about how the dynamic approach is implemented. Obviously, if you go there and say this is the problematic things that that you are doing and you need to do this or this thing in order to improve your skills, then it changes, the approach changes. So what you have observed is shared with the teachers. And your interpretation also shared with them. And you let them basically decide. Now in terms of the measurement, of the measurement issue, the way that we are measuring these factors is not simply whether at some point something happened and at some point something else happened. Because during, during a normal uh, teaching period, you may have some very simple tasks and some more demanding tasks. We are not in favor of the idea that all the tasks that are provided there or all the questions should be process questions. You need a balance between the two. So at the end, the, the scores that emerge from the observation instruments are based on what you have observed during various lessons. Now, in terms of the subject matter, the first study, at least, in the first study, we had the chance to observe primary teachers teaching three different subjects. We conducted three observations per subject, so in total, nine observations per teacher. And we do identify teachers who are situated at different stages in mathematics and in religious education, but not huge differences. And obviously, we took this into account in the intervention that was offered. Now, something that I haven't mentioned earlier, at least the, the last project shows that there is a kind of progression, step by step, because you, we haven't found teachers situated at stage one, for instance, during the first year, and jump to stage four to, during the second year. So a, a progression, very slow actually, can be observed 
After three years, for instance, some teachers, and not all of them, who are sent to the stage four, managed to move to stage five. Some of the issues um, okay. in, in terms of uh, educational uh, equality in classrooms like the UK are based around the fact that we have many paraprofessionals in our school system now, mm -hmm. and in parts of it, up to 40-50% of the yeah. staff yeah. are non-teachers and teaching yeah. assistants. And one of the issues for us is um, which child has access to which professional uh, also, the, the area I work in, in childhood education, has uh, a different proportion of teachers. And I wondered whether you felt um, that if teachers have been identified as traditionally having a teacher yeah. qualification, or whether yeah, yeah. anybody could benefit yeah. from these stages that you've talked about. No, thanks a lot for the comment. We are talking only about classroom teachers, traditional teachers who are responsible for teaching, and you are the right that there are different types of teachers and assistants, especially in early years. So the, the focus is only on teachers who are delivering the curriculum, the main instructors. And uh, the studies actually were conducted at primary school level. So we're talking about classroom teachers here. And obviously the dynamic approach addressed just one aspect of teacher professional development, and this is the how to improve their teaching skills, not other aspects that obviously teacher professional development should cover. Thanks for the comment. And we have one here and then one over there. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Um, I'm really interested in the issue of teacher No. Yeah. yeah, you are right. Maybe I was rushing a bit at that stage. Um, the first three levels basically refer to factors associated with the direct and after teaching approach. And one can see in level one simply the teaching routines, the quantitative dimensions of these factors. For instance, management of time, frequency dimension of structuring, questioning, and skills. Then in, in stage two, you, ident you find there are skills that are concerned with qualitative characteristics of these factors. So uh, teachers, for instance, they don't simply um, provide structuring tasks, enough structuring tasks. They uh, allocate the time pro appropriately during the different parts of the, of the lesson. They have structuring tasks at the beginning, at the end of the lesson, in, in the middle. Yes, they have specific and general structuring tasks, not just specific structuring tasks throughout the, 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 the lesson. This, then you move to stage three, where you can find out that the teachers are able to encourage teacher, teacher, and student, student interactions. So in stage three, you can identify basically the classroom as a learning environment factor. So one can see a move actually from more basic routines and to some extent teacher-directed approaches in stage one to more uh, to, an attempt, to, a, to an attempt of teachers to engage students actively in teaching. As you have seen from the transparency, there is a big gap. And the Saltus model was actually used for this reason to measure this gap. A big gap after the third to move to the fourth stage. At the fourth stage, teachers are able to differentiate their instruction. So they are not just providing tasks. These tasks are not the same 
for each student. They are not providing feedback du uh, or during the, the uh, uh, questioning event. This feedback is constructive and takes into account the needs of each student. So differentiation takes place at the stage four, and there is a big gap to move from stage three to stage four. And finally, in stage five, you have uh, qualitative characteristics of factors associated with the new learning approach, such as the modeling and orientation. You observed many classes where there is no orientation tasks takes place. So uh, in the teachers who are at this stage are basically able to not simply provide orientation tasks, but help students understand the reasons for doing a, a specific task. I don't know if I have answered. Thank you very much. Mm. And we have enough. Oh. So any, any more questions? Yes. Yeah. 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 Very good question. Uh, the, the same big gap there is from level four to level five. If we go the transparency, you will see this, this gap basically in the salt. The, the, uh, the figure was drawn in such a way to show basically the, the gaps. But it's a very good question because uh, the, this group basically deals with differentiation of teaching. You see the big the gap from level three to level four, which is big and big gap from four to five. And the question is, how do you deal with them? What we try to do, first of all, is to help teachers deal, uh, develop skills with more easy um, factors associated with the differentiation. For instance, differentiation of questioning skills, we found it to be more easy to be developed rather than differentiation of structuring tasks or application tasks. With applications, things are rather easier. So we give suggestion to the teacher, each of them is free to develop its own action plan. But based on our experience, we think that it's more easy within this group to deal first with some skills and then move to the others. And obviously, in attempting to do that, you need also to uh, discuss it with uh, students, explain why you differentiate your instruction because most of the times there is suspicion, people may, may uh, are quite uh, critical and uh, with differentiation of instruction, especially here in Cyprus, probably in other countries too. So uh, it's, it, it takes more time and, in, and you need also to bear in, in mind that the other partners, parents and students, should be aware of uh, what you are trying to do with this action plan that you are implementing. We have one more question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I very much enjoyed the, uh, the presentation. Um, you started off by saying that uh, the rationale for uh, focusing on teachers was because there's a greater variance between the classroom and the between schools, which is quite correct. Uh, but I was, I was interested to see the multiple level models where the bulk of variance was actually at the student level. So in the variance, yeah, of course. The models, three quarters of the variance was yeah. at the student level. That's, right. That's true. 10% or so at the teacher level. Now, I think it's still appropriate to focus on the teacher. But Alongside the student. So, I guess I'm asking, um, could you share your thoughts about how you integrate your research program with student level considerations, and also how you get the balance in teacher professional development, which focuses on the teacher, 
whilst recognising that I've been there at the student level. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there's a lot in your stages uh, around uh, different set of instructions. I'm, I'm suspecting that that's good. one way, but I'd like to hear your thoughts yeah. on that. It's a, it's a very good point. First of all, um, when I refer to the classroom level, I compare classroom level with school level variance. So you see that larger proportion of classroom rather than school level. Obviously, more than 65% of variance is situated in most studies at the student level. So student level is very important. And um, Pam Samos actually mentioned in uh, in her introduction that we are working at the moment with projects that attempt to address the equity dimension of uh, effectiveness. Uh, so far we have not uh, uh, many uh, new findings to share with you and we believe that with these uh, studies student level variables will also be taken into account, especially how you deal with teachers who are appointed in socially disadvantaged areas. Uh, and uh, through what the uh, school can do, and through developing its policy as well as the teachers. And at this point, let me just mention to you that at school level, we look at partnership policy. And the focus of the model on partnership policy is basically on how you can improve the home learning environment as a school. Obviously, our interest, because we are, our field is the educational effectiveness, is mainly what the teachers and schools can do in order to promote quality and equity. Thank you for the point. Uh, we have one last question here. OK. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, just to show that we lost the game about everything. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question uh, for Julius. Um, this is a quite positive uh, uh, story about right, how uh, teachers can move from one state to another and uh, finally achieve level four and five. But actually, uh, the current situation is sort of different. And now I'd like to connect it to your issue here because the issue uh, to close the gap and because we go for quality and also we go for quality. Uh, when you look at the results now, then you see that uh, when we move to, uh, uh, to that situation, then we need a lot of people on, on level 5, 4 and 5. The, the current situation is completely different. When we uh, look, for example, the national mm -hmm. for this stage model, then most of our teachers are based on level uh, two and three, and so meaning we don't have enough uh, number of teachers who can get the work of that required. So um, yeah. then the expectation, so my expectation about reaching our final goal, a uh, more equitable society, and uh, based on uh, the work of our teachers, and uh, we can go forever, and uh, after five, four, five, six years, First of all, this, this is this is a good point, and it's good to uh, it's good to uh, maybe I was not clear explaining first of all that, uh, uh, for instance, in religious education, we didn't find any teacher situated at stage five, nobody, and I mentioned that, and I said that this dummy variable was not included. The definition of the stages is based on the difficulty level of the teaching skills and not on whether teachers are situated at this stage. And Bertie is right, and thanks for um, the clarification, that most of the teachers, 32 out of 100, were situated just in stage one. So a big number at that stage. And almost um, more than 80% were situated at the first three stages. Uh, obviously, the fact that there are sta there are more demanding stages like stage four and five is important. We should attempt to uh, help teachers move, take into account also that when the study was offered for a single year, we managed to move teachers from stage one to two or from two to three, just few of them. The, the, the approach 
had an effect statistically significant but small because you had students, you had teachers who managed to improve their teaching skills but not to such extent as to jump from one stage to the other. So obviously it takes more time for teachers to uh, improve their skills and uh, the situation uh, in Netherlands is probably similar with the situation that we have in Cyprus where also the majority of the teachers is situated in stage one and two. Actually similar results emerge from a study conducted in Canada. Again, the most, uh, most teachers were situated in stage one and two. And in this, in this study, we only identify four rather than five stages. The, the fifth and the fourth stage basically collapsed into a single stage. Thank you. Thank you. I think we will probably close the questions now, but just a small observation on that. I think we would expect the variation, if we do find variance at the teacher level, the fact that we're finding variation in teacher behavior and in stages yeah. is perhaps um, not surprising. It, yeah. it, it may be linked. Going back to the equity point, it may be that um, uh, fewer of the uh, more advanced teachers in terms of the stage model are it serving the more disadvantaged communities or the students who may and be at risk of inequality. And this should be the tension, yeah. So that's maybe the next thing yeah. is to look at the distribution of teachers, of teachers who have yeah. access to them, yeah. as well as professional development to move teachers and then, forward. Yeah. And the last point was I think there may be linked yeah. to the notion of scaffolding teachers learning very but, implicit yeah. in the model. Uh, as we encourage teachers to help children in scaffolding. Mm, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thanks. everybody.